Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 don't, no, no, no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 upfront payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. Hello and welcome to Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. I'm Becky Parker Geist and I'm your host. Audiobook Connection is your place to learn about the audiobook creative process in discussions between the authors, narrators, producers, and post production teams that bring them all together, as well as guests who have listened to the audiobooks and have questions for the creative teams. This podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I have the delight to talk with our casting director, Samantha Cooper. Sam has been working with Pro Audio Voices since 2020, and it's been a very fun and exciting to have her as a part of our team. Samantha is also a narrator on stage and screen, and I want to welcome you. Hey, how are you doing, Sam? Good. Thanks so much, Becky. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I know you've been, you started working with Pro Audio Voices as a narrator in our early days, I think it was. I think you were one of our first narrators. And then in 2020, shifted into this role. Well, not entirely. You still narrate with us, which I'm very happy and grateful (laughs) for because you do such great work. And But then we've added in this element of having you as our casting director Tell us a little bit, tell our listeners a little bit about what the casting process is like at Pro Audio Voices. Yeah, absolutely. So what happens first is the, first and foremost, I meet with our authors. Our, that's the most important voice in the room in terms of what we're looking for in a narrator. And we, I learn a little bit about what they hear in their head because the book is their baby. It's what they hear. And they even if they don't think they hear something, They usually do. And so we narrow down what their vision is or what their oral vision is really (laughs) for a narrator based on what they either like in things that they've heard or just, again, what they hear in their head. And we narrow, sometimes we narrow down gender, age, vocal tones, and sometimes it's across the board and they're not sure. And that's when we really get to play. And then I'll talk to them about a selection for the audition, a selection of text. We like to keep it short and sweet so everybody's time is valued. And then I send it to our wonderful narrator pool. And again, I'll send it to, if the specs are narrowed, I only send it to a select group of people. And if not, I send it to, if it's the Wild West, I send it to everybody and see what comes in because you never know. And then I list, then the narrators, we like to give them some ample time to prepare because everyone's busy. And then they send in files and I'm listening to them as they come in and filing them in my own fun spreadsheet way and putting them in different folders. And then at the end, I narrow it down, depending on the project, to maybe eight to 10 top selects and I send those and what I call our second wave of people that are just wonderful but may not fit the spec exactly right or just don't make the first top eight to ten and I send that over to our our author and they end up fully selecting. Yeah. So we gear them, we steer them in a right direction or what I think is a right direction and then they make the final selection. I think that is confusing to some narrators. They're not sure who makes it but it's really the author who chooses in the end. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that overview. That's terrific. And then so when you're in that call with the authors, like what are some of the the questions that you ask them? Because a lot of our listeners are authors who may not have gone through the audiobook process yet and are trying to get a feel for what is this? How can I prepare myself to be ready for stepping into that first piece? Right. What might you ask them? We ask them, there's some standard questions we ask. Again, I want to know gender. I want to know age. I want to know any sort of racial or ethnic background if they want that specifically. And tone in terms of, because sometimes people want, I want a really deep voice or I want a more tenor sound or a mezzo sound and they know. And that's okay if you don't. So I'm looking for those types of specifics. I'm looking for what they 
want in the type of storytelling. So some people want a more what I call a theatrical sound. And some people want it really casual and close to the mic and talking to a friend-ish. Yeah. And so we narrow that down a bit. And then I also ask, I ask if there's any singing. I ask if there's anything, like content warnings I need to be aware of because I don't get to read the full book before we cast as much as I would love to. I definitely read chunks and do a lot of skimming as well to get the gist, but, and nor will our narrators, right? I want to make sure that I'm having the same experience as a narrator would have when I first see the copy of the text. And I want to know if there's anything else I should be aware of right. before I say yes or no to a book. It just saves us time on the front end. I think it's the right thing to do to just make sure everybody's on the same page about what the book contains. Right. And I know that there are those moments where if something comes up that we weren't alerted to, maybe it's some piece of extreme violence or sexual content or any number of things that can come up and suddenly the narrator who's already like in the midst of the project goes, oh, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah. And and that's really hard. Yeah. And that's not to say many narrators will be able to read the full manuscript in advance and prepare in advance. And it's not it that's not across the board and it's not mandatory for a great read. So that's one of the reasons why we need to really know from the author about anything that they think might trigger someone else. It may not be a, an issue for them, but could trigger someone else. Yeah. And as a narrator myself, I always like to read the full book so I know exactly what I'm getting into. But that doesn't always happen before the yes happens, right? right? So like, I definitely always want to read the book to prep as a narrator. But when I'm saying yes to the project from Pro Audio Voices or whatever, that always doesn't get to happen. And yeah, it's important that we just, everyone's aware of what could potentially trip up because then it saves everybody time and money and we love saving those things and and honors their humanity, which I think is what we're trying to do. It's part of our core values. Absolutely, yeah. And then we also ask, I throw a curveball at them in session, in, in the meeting, usually to see what their initial gut reaction is. Sometimes they have an answer and sometimes they don't. But I love to know what their dream celebrity casting is mm-hmm. because sometimes they know or they can give me a couple, like two or three. And then I usually email them afterwards to confirm in case they get inundated. I'm a lot of energy. So I think sometimes also <laughs> authors are overwhelmed a little bit in a good way that they have so much to think about. But, and I'm not looking for voice matches. I'm looking for energy and tone. Yeah. And the way people tell a story. And sometimes as a po- if an author can't necessarily find the language to describe what they want, uh, attaching what they want to a celebrity or whether it's an actor or a politician or anybody that we that many people know, it's helpful for me because as I'm listening, I can be like, ah, yes, that is that is Oprah Winfrey energy or that is, right. I don't know, what else do we get? Like Angela Lansbury energy. Morgan Freeman. <laughs> exactly. Lots of Morgan Freeman, of course. So that's always really helpful. Yeah. And fun. Yeah. And I think helpful for the narrators as well when we know that if an audition call is going out and we have a, an idea of, oh, I'm really listening for a voice that get, or a sound that gives me this feeling or this tone. That's, yeah. I think the more information I give to narrators as a narrator myself, to me, it's more, it's helpful. Obviously, as narrators, we're going to be ourselves and right. that's what we bring to the table. But having a direction, having a path to go in, because there's so many different options usually is, I find really helpful. Yeah. And I think our narrator team does too. Yeah. And you mentioned... The voice in the head, the voice in the head of the author. And this can be a tricky thing because sometimes authors will have a very specific sound that they're listening for that. And especially if it's like they want someone to sound exactly like them. Yep. I'm like, usually it's them. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Not usually. Often. Sometimes we run into that. Yeah. But they're like, oh, it's just me. (laughs) (laughs) And that's not, that's not really a real voice that actually exists. (laughs) Because, you know, your voice in your head or anyone listening, it's whatever your voice in your head is not actually the voice that comes out into the world. Right. I may think I sound husky, but I do not. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) Unless it's very early in the morning. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I think actually a physical reason why that's that is true is we're listening through the bones in our head, but it's a, it has a very different physical sound to mm-hmm. us mm-hmm. when that's we're true. just hearing ourselves. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Yeah. And then what about accents? What do you... We ask for that too. We ask for that too. And sometimes, again, in the same way that I've heard a story of a fellow narrator once that didn't 
read their full book when they were prepping and they got to the end and all of a sudden they were like, and he said in his Irish brogue or something that he, <laughs> and he had been reading this character the whole time, not knowing there was an Irish brogue. I can't remember who this, if someone is listening and knows who this story <laughs> is attached to, let us know. Yeah. And so that's why I always prep by reading the whole book. But yeah. I keep that in the back of my head. But accents are important. We want to make sure that, and I feel very strongly about this, that no one is doing an accent, A, that they don't feel comfortable doing. B, if they have time to prep, great. We like to let people know ahead of time because some people have accents in their back pocket or some people are a quick study. I usually, I can find a way and, and do it, but I need to learn what it's, what it is. And I feel very strongly about, for example, I identify as a Caucasian Jewish person, like I should not be doing accents that I don't identify with that. Whoever, how do I say this? The country of origin, Mm -hmm. depending on where it is, I feel pretty strongly that I don't narrate those. But sometimes it is a little tricky when we're doing single narrators and they have to narrate all sorts of accents. So we make sure we say that up front. So whatever people are comfortable with and audiobooks is a little, it's hard because we you can't always do a multicast project because sometimes right. we do that too. Sometimes we have multicast projects where people are, however they identify, they're slotted into sort of the appropriate roles. But with mm-hmm. a single narrator, that's not always possible. Right. So we do the right. best we can. Yeah. And then do you, in books where, let's say there are maybe, oh, I've got 15 different accents and different characters that are like maybe smaller parts or whatever, you know, what kind of advice would you give to an author who has an expectation that they're going to be able to hear a wide Mm. wide range of accents? Temper your expectations so that it might be more of the general, it might not be, maybe it'd be more a region as opposed to a specific Mm -hmm city or town right? from which, you know, unless their budget is monumental and then we can find those specific people, but it will take some time. (laughs) Yeah. I know we did a project not, I think it was last year, where we had the casting was in hopes of finding someone who could do a very specific dialect within New Orleans, Mm -hmm. within an area, a neighborhood of New Orleans. And what we found was that when the auditions came in, that there we had somebody who could do that, but we had someone else who could do it. Not quite that, but the storytelling was so much better. And we run into that too. Like, do you go, and then it's in the end, it ends up being in the author's hands. Do you want the right storyteller with maybe less of the accent that the less pinpointed accent, or do you want the accent less of the storyteller? And that's really up to them. Right. I know what I would choose, but again, I'm. it's not my baby. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I would definitely choose the storyteller, someone who can convey that story. Yeah, because that's what people are listening to. And right. not that accents and where it is doesn't matter because it does. Right. Mm-hmm. And also voices change and accents change. And if you're from one block versus another block, it could be different based on your lived experience too. That doesn't mean you're not from right. that place. It's an interesting conversation. It's always evolving. Yeah, I think so too. And the just... Even the fact that we are not only mobile, but that we're communicating across neighborhoods and states and communities and cultures so much more fluidly than we used Mm -hmm. to. And accents, I think, are less, I don't know if pure is the right word. They're not so confined as they used to be when people were mostly like staying in one region or one town and staying put and communicating with the other people in that town, those dialects would form in a strong way. But I I think it's, there's a lot more fluidity. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. So when you're doing that that vetting process and you've been through talking with the author and you know from them what they're listening for, is there any way that you can explain to us like how you do that vetting? Do you listen to a little bit of one and a little bit of another or do you Yeah. Tell us about what that. Sure. I'm a little bit of an, I don't even want to say overachiever because I think that's not the right word. But as a narrator, I want to, I try to listen to, well, I definitely listen to everything. I don't listen to everything all the way through if I know immediately. Because sometimes if the author is really specific, I'm going to know immediately. Even if I've done the most detailed casting breakdown, all of our brains work differently. And what, you know, what I'm communicating out into the world to our narrator pool, they might hear it or read it differently and they might audition anyway even if they're not right Mm -hmm. for it which happens so 
First, I'm looking for following instructions. Let's just say that right off the bat. I'm looking for following instructions. (laughs) I understand as a voice talent myself, as you are too, we are auditioning all the time, every day. Labeling is different. We read a million briefs a week. You know, it happens and I have a lot of great, I give a lot of grace. However, I, following instructions is very important to me. Are your things labeled right? Are you slating even I told you not to? Because that takes time. We all, now that everything is virtual, back in the day when you were going to the booth, you might need to slate, et cetera. But because it's coming from my file and I'm (laughs) my computer and I'm labeling it, I know it's Samantha's, I know it's Becky's file because you labeled it that way. I don't need to hear your name at the beginning. And that's just a personal preference because also that saves me three seconds of time per listening. So if you slate, it's not that you're out of the running, but I was like, (laughs) I have all, I might even write, did not write instructions. Now, are you barred from our, in my mind forever? No, no. Again, I love to give grace. So following instructions, is it labeled correctly, et cetera. Then I'm listening for connection to the text. Even though we're reading books, and I fall into this too, we sound like we're reading. And with audiobooks, that is actually okay in some ways. But I still want to hear connection and not, my voice is beautiful. I've been told that my voice is beautiful and that I do audiobooks all day long. And this is the tone I use for all of my audiobooks. And that is beautiful, but I can hear when you think your voice is beautiful. And right. that's not what I want to hear. I want you telling the story of the author, what the author wrote because that's what's important. Yeah. And what else am I looking for? So connection to the text, following instructions, I'm listening for your audio quality. This is unfortunately unfair now. I mean, now with audiobooks for us, at least it was always this way, you know, that people mm-hmm. are recording from home. Now we are all recording from home. We know this. And hopefully as we learn and grow, we can make our studios the best that they can be. And we can grow and I can't, I don't know, a colleague of mine says, grow up and I can't remember what she says, but basically as we grow as you go, that's what she says. Yeah. So yeah, as you're starting out, I don't think that your studio needs to be the creme de la creme of studios, but if we're going to cast you, it needs to be pretty good because our team can do a lot on the back end, but not, nobody can, you can't make up for poor sound Yeah. in a lot of ways. Poor space, I'll say, poor space. So I'm listening for that. And if your studio is not up to snuff with the rest of the pool that I'm listening to, then you're weeded out first. Yeah. And then I'm listening for spec. I'm listening for how close you are to the spec from the author. Yeah. Good. And uh, just side note here for any narrators that may be tuned in here would be the note that we actually created a program knowing we have narrators in our talent pool that where their sound could be better their studio sound could be better. We actually created a program, a narrator resources program that will allow, oh, I said that wrong. Anyways, it's an, it's an NPR program is what we call it, <laughs> production <laughs> resources, to help narrators improve their audio quality because it is so critical. And it's daunting too. We're not engineers and nor right. should we be, in my opinion, but it's easy. The more you do it, I will say to just narrators in general and authors listening who are narrating their own stuff, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. I remember having to like dub via video when lockdown first happened and I was in tears because I couldn't get Reaper to do what I wanted it to do. I was like crying in my booth. I was so frustrated and so upset. So we've all been there and it does get easier. (laughs) And but yeah, it's important. Yeah. Because we all know, even with commercials and during lockdown and even still now, you can hear it when the sound isn't good. You can just hear it. So that. But there are lots of resources and our team is great about helping. I think they've even helped me out too. Oh, move your mic over here. Yeah. Turn up your gain when we're in, when it's, when we're in multicast stuff, which is also fun. Yeah. Let's take just a short pause. And when we come back, we're going to jump into some of those questions about full cast productions. Do you have a book that you imagine with multiple voices or a screenplay or stage play? At Pro Audio Voices, we love working on these more complex productions with music and sound effects and a full cast of voices. Bringing together decades of experience in both theater and audio production, our team brings your project to life. From manuscript preparation to casting to directing the actors, and a post-production team to bring it all together, Pro Audio Voices brings your project to life. Learn more at proaudiovoices.com forward slash full dash cast. 
So as you mentioned, when we left off you, the multicast or the full cast productions, it's one of my personal favorites working on those. From a casting perspective, what is that experience like? Uh, it's a giant puzzle piece, which I know you usually <laughs> yeah. help me on. <laughs> we have to have both of our minds working on it at all times. You create a giant massive document of who is reading when and if we can double people up or if we can't. And that meeting with an author is a little bit longer. But again, we don't always go through every character. If it's multicast and it's many characters, we go through the, we definitely go through a narrator. We go through at the main characters and what they sound mm -hmm. like. And sometimes I'll be communicating with the author as we go along to check in in case we realize that actually a role is bigger than we thought or speaks more, not mm -hmm. bigger, but speaks more than we thought. We want to check back in to make sure we're in alignment with what the author thought. But it's fun because we get to play and we get to cast more people, which I love because I get really disappointed. So many, our narrators are so wonderful. They're so talented and everyone is so talented. And so when people are not cast, it's not that they aren't good. And I have to tell yeah. myself this as a talent. It's not that yeah. I'm not great. <laughs> yeah. It's just that I either didn't fit the spec or I happened to listen to someone before I listened to you and you sounded a little right. similar yeah. and they might have, who knows? So much of it is left up to chance. Again, I try to be super fair. I make sure I stop listening when I have ear fatigue, which happens because mm -hmm. if you're listening to the same thing over and over and over again and everybody's saying the same words over and over and over again, you get fatigued and it's true. Yeah. I'm human. Yeah. So I really try to be fed, watered, slept, <laughs> and take breaks yeah, when I feel like ear fatigue. That's just a side note. But so multicast, we really get to play and we get to cast more people, which I love. And especially with my background as a theater actor, I love it because when it's like directing a little bit, it's casting a play. It feels like casting yeah. a play, which I like. Now, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think when you first started in with casting for us, we were working on Quantum, The Trilogy Begins. Were we like at the tail end? You were, but we were the tail end, so I didn't actually get to help tail. cast that. But yes. Right. Okay. Okay. But our more recent project, Fight or Flight, we had, I think it was 18 in I the cast. So. I think so. And yeah. Now, in that case, in Quantum, we had people around the globe because we had a lot of international mm -hmm. characters or characters from many different countries that we were casting. In this case, I think we were all... In the U.S., Does, is that right? I think we were, but we were definitely on times. I think people definitely, are yes. we're always on different time zones. But yes, I think we had yeah. a, a smattering of time zones for sure. Yeah. It really is a fun process when we get to record those projects. And yeah, it's fun to hear a little bit about the casting piece of that. Mm -hmm. What would you say is are some of the more challenging things in, you know, for the in casting, what what would you say are some of the most, more challenging things? Mm, well, one that many people are good. <laughs> I would yeah. find that challenging. <laughs> yeah. Because if it's if they aren't, it's easy. If they weren't, mm -hmm. it would our my job would be so easy. But it's not because people are great, and I want to give people a chance. I definitely, you know, if people's work is consistently good, I want to reward that. I know that, but I can't. That's not actually the job. But I still am always like, oh, that person is <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> so great. So I'd say that knowing, yeah, knowing that people, for me, knowing that people are putting effort into something that they might, that they won't see an immediate reward for is hard mm -hmm. because I yeah. know how that feels. Yeah. So I think that's for me the hardest part of casting. And then the most, and it's also, it's, the other hard part is when it's rare that this happens, I feel like, but there have been a couple times where either the author isn't super clear about what they want and can't commute and hasn't can't communicate that. And so I have to interpret in my own way and then we are misaligned. But that really hasn't happened that much. And that's why I also right. do a second wave. So if my eight to 10 are really off the mark, then there's a bunch of great people that could be right. right. But I feel I'm, it's disappointing work-wise because I want to, I, my goal is, are they happy with the narrator? Great. Right. And then occasionally yeah. it's happened where something can go or, and I don't know if you want to speak about this, but like we can go awry <laughs> uh -huh. when a narrator has to drop out of a project, which again yeah. is very rare, but right. that happens from time to time. And then that's really a disappointment right. because right. it's a bummer because also, again, the first wave of people, like everybody put an effort and could have, some other people could have done it. And then sometimes we get lucky and that goes to that second person, but sometimes right. it doesn't. And so that's a bit disappointing too. It's hard when 
that happens. Yeah, yeah. And the things come up where people get, especially in when we were like having a lot of things come with COVID and then sometimes like right. their voice would change like for a long time after or other, yeah, other life challenges have shown up to be obstacles. So it, it does happen. Yeah. Thankfully, not very yeah. often. But yeah. What would you say is the most fun and rewarding part? Casting people. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> giving people jobs. I love giving yeah. people work. I really, yeah. I enjoy that. I enjoy getting it myself and I, but mostly I enjoy giving it to others because I know this is hard. What we do is so hard. Yeah. And and yeah, and getting that email back from people being like, oh, I really loved this text. Feels so connected to it. I like when people say that too, even mm -hmm. in their audition. I don't mind like a very short email yeah. about when people say why they connect to a text. It doesn't, again, does it mean I'm throwing you into the ring automatically? No, but does it mean, but I yeah. like hearing that story because again, I like the human process of this. And because I do a lot of this alone, it's nice to feel connected to the people I'm listening to. Yeah. We had a really interesting project where it was a nonfiction book about interior design. And then it turned out that the narrator also had experience in interior design. It was like, <laughs> it was like, oh my gosh, what an interesting connection. I don't think we even discovered that until after the fact. Oh, that's so funny. I, yeah. Was like, yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but maybe that must be, yeah. I, was like, I yeah, must not have known that. Cool. Yeah. yeah, that's funny. And then there's the occasionally we have somebody who an author who has the budget and the interest and the drive to hire a celebrity narrator. So is there anything that you would like to say about how that process might look different or it might not be necessarily a celebrity narrator? It might just be somebody that they have identified who in their own minds is like a really high profile yeah, I, usually that happens. And then we are dealing with their agents as mm -hmm. opposed to them or however we can get a hold of them. And so more, it's definitely more work enters the fray yeah. for sure. And it can be, there's a lot of negotiating that goes on. And when more people are involved, there's a lot more communicating that goes on. And I would say for authors to know that it might not be possible, not because we're not trying our hardest, but like basically schedules or people, you know, if someone high profile is working on other stuff, the deadlines would have to change. So I think it's about identifying what is the most important thing for you is the important thing releasing at a certain time is the important thing having a more seamless process is the important thing having that person and it may be and if it is having that person, then some other things need to adjust in order to... Yeah. Thanks. Accommodate that. And is there anything else that comes to mind as like what you would really love authors to know about the, you know, if there was like the top thing that you really want authors to know? Ooh, the top thing. I'll try to see if I can come up with a couple. But one of them is yeah. don't worry, we don't need to read all of your text to know, not me, like in the audition. Yeah. Less is more. You'll know. And we can always do a callback. We do that, which we didn't actually talk about. There's occasion. Right. And again, it's it means more work, more time in general in terms of lengthening the process for the author because mm -hmm. that takes more time. But we can always do a callback with a smaller group of actors mm -hmm. if you need to hear more. But the likelihood is that you don't, mostly because you do have that voice in your head. Even if you don't know that you do, yeah. or you, what I always say is trust your instinct. You're going to know within the first three seconds if something is right. I actually take more time because I'm not the author. So I don't always know if it's, I'll know if it's like mostly right in the first three seconds, but I'll listen to a little bit more, especially if there's, if we're asking for two sections, which right. we can do, especially mm -hmm. if there's a lot of dialogue, I'll ask for a little bit of narration so we can hear that. And then a little bit of dialogue so we can hear how a narrator works with character. Right. Especially if they, or not even especially, but if they want more theatrical or more kind of easy breezy sound or more subtle with their dialogue. Yeah. I'll want to hear that. But even those chunks can be very short. Yeah. So I'd say yeah. trust us when we say that it can be short because we can always do more later. And uh, that we understand that this is hard to give, to, that it's hard to give over the reins potentially to other people who didn't write your book. And yeah. we get that. And we yeah. are going to handle that with as much care as 
we can. And also to know that like we are experts in our field, just as you were as an expert in your field. I would say just trust us as much as you can and we'll handhold you the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Great. Anything that you feel like you would really like narrators or people who are interested in narrating audiobooks and maybe haven't taken that step yet, but are kind of learning about what all that's about, anything that you would especially like them to know? Follow instructions. Good. <laughs> <laughs> Follow and read, read everything, read it twice. I have to do this too. Like we just think we know and then blah. don't be afraid to ask questions and know that if we don't cast you or haven't cast you in a while, it's not because we don't like you or because you're not talented. Right. <laughs> but that's so <laughs> rare. I can count the number. I can, there have maybe been three people in the two and a half years that I've been doing this for you where I, we've been like, nope, not that person, never again. Right. That's happened so rarely. But yeah, it's not that we're not thinking about you. It's either we're having a slower period or it's just, or we're casting all male identified narrators or we're casting all British speakers. You never know, but it's hard. So yeah, follow instructions. Know you're very talented. Keep upgrading your space if you can. Treat every audition as if it's the job, like as if you already have it, which most people are so great about doing. Yeah. But we can hear something. I can hear confidence. I can mm-hmm. hear it. I can hear it when you're in it and I can hear it when when narrators are like, please pick me, like it's in their voice, I can hear it. And I have to tell myself this too. I'm saying all things I also have to tell myself as a narrator and a voice talent, but we can hear it. It's wild. (laughs) When you listen to them over and over again and everybody's saying the same thing, you can hear it. Well, Sam, I want to thank, oh, and we should let people know where if they want to apply to be on our narrator team, you can go to proaudiovoices.com in the contact drop down of the menu, there is a place for apply for the narrator team. Mm -hmm. And for authors, if you are intrigued and ready to jump into a conversation about casting, you can book a discovery call on proaudiovoices.com. Just hit get started and we'll get you scheduled for that. Sam, thank you so much for joining us today. It was really fun talking with you about casting. It was. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. And I hope you'll join us next time as well for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Thanks for joining us for Audiobook Connection, behind the scenes with the creative teams. Please take a moment to subscribe at audiobookconnection.com. The podcast is sponsored by Pro Audio Voices, helping great stories come alive through audiobook production and marketing. Learn more at ProAudioVoices.com. Again, thanks for being with us, and please join us next week. This podcast is a part of the C-Suite Radio Network. For more top business podcasts, visit c-suiteradio.com.